Hi, I'm Mark Maddioli, and welcome to another reading of my novel, Boston Accent. Boston Accent is available on Amazon.com. And this uh, Boston Accent is of adult subject matter. Okay. And even if you're an adult, it may be disturbing to you. Okay. Here we go. This is picking up where we left off, Chapter 6, College. Although I wasn't allowed in the dorms, I still had access to the student union, a small recreational area in the basement of a second dorm facility across the square. There wasn't much to it, just a bar against one wall and two pool tables in the center of the room. Several tables and chairs ran, ran along the walls with a television set set up in an alcove in the far corner away from the bar. Access to the, to the union was restricted to students and their guests. One night, Sean and another Irish friend of mine, Kevin, came into town to see me. On their last visit, we had gotten separated, and they had decided to walk to the apartment to see if I was there. Problem was, they thought it would be clever to walk underground through the subway tunnel. The only thing they had on their side was it was 3 o'clock in the morning, and the trains weren't running. There was still the chance that they could be electrocuted by the third rail or fall on your face in the dark and get bit by a rat. They were halfway through the tunnel when they heard a train approaching, and they both started running towards the exit where the train comes out of the ground. The vibration beneath their feet increased as the train got closer. In the dark, they could now make out the rats as they scurried at their feet to find their own safety. They reached the exit and scrambled up a wall off the tracks as the train came out of the tunnel right behind them. The train was a single unit maintenance car with two workers on it, and one worker shined a flashlight on them as they passed, but never slowed down. Sean and Kevin lay back on the wall, breathing in the fresh air as, as Sean said, Let's not do that again anytime soon. Kevin replied, No shit. As Sean and Kevin arrived on this evening, I was pretty confident there would be no tunnel hijinks tonight, as tonight was cause for celebration. I was nearing the end of my freshman year, and I would soon be headed home to, to Pineville for the summer. I signed Sean and Kevin in as my guests at the entrance to the Union, and we headed to the bar. We got a pitcher of beer and found a table in the corner and decided we wanted to shoot pool. The three of us loved the game, and although Kevin and I were halfway decent, Sean was really good and could run the table for hours. Both tables were occupied, so we lay our quarters on the side of the table, signifying our challenge to the winner and our order of play. It wasn't long before the three of us were playing on both tables. We went through several pitches of beer as we played. We were having a great time when I noticed the pitch was empty and I headed to the bar for a refill. The union was now packed with students and guests. The bar was three deep, and it took a while to get service from the lone bartender. As I was waiting my turn, I spotted several students I hung out with from the dorm, and we began talking. While still waiting for my picture, I felt someone putting their weight on me and, and pushing me to the side. I looked up, and there was a student I had seen around. He was a jock type, big enough to play football. He looked down at me and said, move so someone can get a beer. I told him, wait your fucking turn, and he shoved me hard into the guys I was talking to. That's when all hell broke loose, and it started with me punching this guy in the face. While he was stunned, I spun him around and threw him onto the table where his buddies were sitting, knocking the table over and spilling all their beers. His friends jump up and come after me, but they're outnumbered as my friends jump in and surround them, grabbing them by their shirts. He knocked our friend down, one of them protests as he points at me. I shake my head while saying, he started it by putting his hands on me. He's got a cast on his leg, he continued as he turned around and pointed to his friend that was now in a chair where you could visibly see he had on a knee-high walking cast. Well, then he's a moron for starting a fight, I answer, and my friends begin laughing, which just makes the jocks even madder. I step around the overturned chairs and head to our table to get my jacket, followed by Sean and Kevin. They look over their shoulder, waiting for retaliation. Sure, this isn't over. As I put my jacket on, and I tell them, let's go somewhere else. They grab the coats, and we head towards the door. As we pass a pool table, the jock friend who wanted revenge walks between the tables and takes a swing at me. 
I had seen him coming, and as he swung at me, I sidestepped him and grabbed the eight ball off the table. He stumbled past me, and with one motion, I brought the clenched ball up and slammed him in the side of the head. He dropped to the floor, and the three of us continued on our way out the door, only now a little quicker. My friends for years have accused me of starting brawls that they inadvertently get injured in, and as soon as we're outside, I assured them this wasn't my doing. We then went down to the rat to catch a band and relax over more beers. It was now past closing time. And as we strode through the square towards Sean's car, I spotted three young women walking towards a pay to park lot. I was walking ahead of Sean and Kevin, who stopped to look in a storefront window as I watched the girls get in their car. I then went and stood at the exit to the parking lot and waited for them to pull up. As the car approached, I put up my thumb to hitchhike and they stopped. The driver yelled through the open passenger window, Where are you headed? I leaned down close, smiled, and said, Wherever you're going works for me. And she said, Get in. I wink and say, Great. I have two friends. Is it all right? She says, Why not? So I yelled to Sean and Kevin, Come on, we got a ride. They look at each other confused, and then back at me, and Sean says, A ride? We have a car. I yelled, No, this is better. Hurry up, let's go. Sean gets in the back seat with me, with one of the girls sitting be between us. Kevin jumps up in the front, and the girl riding shotgun slides over next to the driver. Now we're driving through Boston while making introductions when the driver gets on the on-ramp for the highway. Kevin turns around, looks at me, and says, where are we going? I pull you off and say, we're going to party with these three young ladies. Kevin leans towards the driver and asks, where are we going? And the driver tells him, Bonville which is roughly 25 miles north of Boston. Sean and Kevin both give me concerned looks and then shake their heads. Don't worry about it, I tell them. This is going to be fun. Okay, I need to get a little bit more coffee in me. It's, it's early. Oh, yeah, baby. I'm seated right behind the driver, talking to her from the moment we get in the car. Sean and Kevin are trying to make small talk with the other two, but they seem less than thrilled that we are in the car. As I talk to the driver, Meg, I lean forward in the seat and put my hand on her shoulder. I'm looking at her in the rearview mirror, which, is, which she is looking in also while trying to watch the road. As we drive along, I bend to discreetly rub her back and then her neck while we talk. Very soft, very slowly, the whole time reading her body language and watching her, her expression in the mirror, which is a big smile. I then decide to push the envelope as I slide my hand over her left shoulder and down her left side, and she does not react. I check the mirror, and she is still smiling as I reach my hand up and cup her breast and begin to slowly caress it through her shirt. I feel she is not wearing a bra, and my fingers go to her nipple, which is hotter than an eraser on a pencil and just as long. She begins to squirm a little and her breathing gets heavy as she places her hand on mine and then unbuttons her blouse and places my hand on her bare breasts. I look around the car to see if anyone is watching this and Sean and Kevin are still trying to get the other two girls to warm up to them. No one is watching me except for Meg and that's when I push her hair off her neck and start to kiss it gently. Meg shudders and leans forward away from me and says, we're almost there, and I sit back in the seat. Just then, the girl in the back seat says, Meg, drop me off. Of course, her voice wasn't that deep. Oh, this isn't good, I'm thinking, and I say, You're not going home, are you? The party's just starting. I have to get up early, she says, as Meg slows down in front of a house, and, and the girl tells Sean, Let me get out. We are now down to two. Five minutes later, we're in Meg's basement apartment, raiding her liquor cabinet and fridge. Kevin is putting the moves on Meg's friend, who is a very attractive blonde, but she has this permanent scowl on her face, and he's getting nowhere. She finally says goodnight, goes into one of the, bed one of the bedrooms, shuts the door, and we hear it lock. I look at Kevin and say, ouch. Meg nods to Sean and Kevin and says, you can sleep on the couches. I'll get you a pillow and a blanket. Meg returns with the pillows and blankets, takes me by the hand, and leads me to her room. 
I wake up a few hours later and take a peek under the sheets to see who I'm in bed with. I'm very pleased with what I see. I get up to find the bathroom. As I walk through the living room, bare ass, I see Sean and Kevin asleep on the couches. As I come out of the bathroom, I shake Kevin and ask him, where are we? And he says, I don't know. Ask Sean. I walk over to Sean, shake him and ask, do you know where we are? Sean says, Bonville, you asshole, without a fucking car. So I let that sink in and head back to Meg's room. Wait, and I wake her up so we can pick up where we left off. I don't think that the fact that Meg was a little loud helped my situation with my pissed off friends. When Meg and I get dressed and come into, into the living room, Sean and Kevin are waiting with the coats on. Are you guys leaving? I was going to make breakfast, Meg asked them. No thanks, we have to get back to Boston and get our car. Sean says, give me a look that kills. Meg asks if I'm staying, and I say, I have to go also, but could she tell us how to get back to the highway? She says it's not far, and she'll bring us there, but she can't drive us back to Boston unless we want to wait till later, which none of us wants to do. Meg drops, drops us off at a highway on-ramp, and we thank each other for the evening, and I place her phone number in my pocket, where it sits untouched for the life of the jacket. Sean and Kevin have already walked halfway down the ramp without me as I yell, Wait up! Sean flips me off and says, No one, no one is going to pick up three of us hitchhiking. You're on your own. Fine, I say to myself, and I zipper up my jacket as the cold morning air starts to hit me. As I zip my coat up, I feel something bulging in my jacket. I have no clue what it could be as I reopen my jacket and check the inside pocket. My hand finds something round and hard, and I think, what the hell, as I pull out an eight ball. I'll be damned, I smile, as the earlier portion of the evening comes back to me. Just then, a cop pulls over, and the driver offers me a ride. Thanks for stopping. I'm headed to Boston, and those two gentlemen up ahead of me are with me. Do you mind? No problem, the driver, a man in his 30s, says. As Sean and Kevin climb into the back seat and thank the driver for stopping, I turn to them smiling and say, you're welcome. They look at each other and shake their heads. All right. That's the end of that little ditty. We'll pick up again where we left off next time. Um, we're reading Boston Accent. My name is Mark Mattioli. And uh, we'll do this again soon. This book is available on Amazon.com. All right. Ciao.